All right, All right. Now, you may have seen him at Flappers. And if you haven't, get your ass over there and see him at Flappers. We have, and I'm doing this voice just for you, Paul, from Flappers. So I can do this voice here? <laughs> meow, meow. I don't know if I should do that. <laughs> Anyways, Paul Moomji! Woo! Hey! Hello, hello. Oh, hey, Paul, Paul, you're still on mute there. I'm sorry, but these new talky things are very hard to operate. Can you hear me there now? Go. Yeah! yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I, How you doing? I'm glad to know, based on the last segment, that the future of comedy is small children and music. I am <laughs> thrilled to hear that the future of comedy is mimes. Mime, <laughs> small children, and music. Not Richard Pryor, not George Carlin. Mimes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it is what it is. I don't know what to say. I know, I know. That's the Tell TikTok. us how you really feel, Paul. Tell us how no, you really no, feel. No, that, that's the TikTok. That's that's what happened. We have this conversation every day at Flappers where it's like, what's what's people TikToking about? Because that's that's where comedy's going, is that it's uh I do think that people are a little tired of just watching people talk. I will say that. I think that there's some people just don't want to watch people just talk for 20, 30 minutes. Um, I don't know about you guys. You ever been to a comedy show where you find that the show kind of livens up a little bit when the comedian starts to do uh, crowd work? Yeah. Right. All of a sudden, yeah. it's like, right. They're going like, "What's the deal with Tinder?" And then they start doing crowd work, and then the audience feels part of the act a little bit more. Well, so that's one like, of the yeah, things I love about British right? comedy. I, I love that in British comedy, a lot of times the big names they actually devote a section of their show to taking the piss from the crowd. They allow the crowd to heckle them. They come back at them. I mean, people that are great at this is Jimmy Carr. Um, uh, oh, Frankie Boyle. If you see yeah. him, he's really good at the crowd work. I mean, he automatically starts going in and just raz, you know, going razzing the crowd or roasting them right away. So. No, but you're actually right. So I actually watched my first outside comedy show since the pandemic last night. And uh, the incredible uh, Craig Robinson was the headliner. And he's actually, he, he does perform with flappers very often, right, Paul? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, like it's, it's been eight months, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that it applies everywhere. But right. <laughs> um, he's, he's, he's a musical comedy. And he was such a crowd pleaser because what he did was he incorporated the audience to a majority of the set. And almost every previous com a comedian that went before him just did their basic set. And the jokes didn't land as strong compared to those yeah. that actually tried to talk to their, to their crowd. Now that could sometimes go very well, like it did last night, or it could go really, really, really Badly, especially if you have a drunk girl, which is my worst heckler. I can never control the drunk girl. And I can't say anything because I'm probably the drunk girl at Las Vegas shows. No, the, uh, the, the, the drunk girl at a comedy club will usually be escorted out by management. <laughs> so, like, like, in all reality, I actually, my first major hosting gig was hosting for Tom Segura. And there was oh, wow. a drunk girl. Yeah, and it was a drunk girl in the front crowd. And I was told, go tell her if she doesn't you know, stop talking, we're going to pull her out of the show. So a club should be able to handle that. Uh, but a, but a, a, an alternative venue, a bar, a restaurant, that's where it gets tougher because they just spent $24 on food. And that's the only, you know, and, and the restaurant does not fit as many people as the club. So, yeah, no, the, 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 the drunk heckler... The, the worst, though, I ever had was a bachelorette party at a bar. That oh, was rough. Wow. I mean, that Paul, and you said a club should be able to handle it. I have found a club handles a drunk girl really well. Yeah, I think that for the most part, they usually have a... Yeah, no, well, uh, not at flappers. No. <laughs> <laughs> not what you call it flappers. We do not flap them. Soon, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no clubbing people at flappers. No. They don't bring out the baby seal club, no. No. No, that would be at Flippers. At Flippers. <laughs> yes. That's right. I, I, I mean, there are some incredible comedians that have actually handled the drunk heckler really yeah. well that I've been impressed in, and I've seen a few. I personally 
have not done well in that in that aspect. Like I, I've definitely had, I've only had two incidents that I couldn't control. But it, it takes true talent. If, if you see a comedian on stage handling somebody that's disturbing the entire show, and they do really well, you have to give them props because it's not an easy thing, especially as you're trying to get to every third word, and she's just screaming or just trying to have a conversation in the middle of your set it, it, it it's pretty rough but well, I, think, I think the the core of the issue is comedians who do not care if the audience likes them has no problem going after the heckler but if but if you come from a background in which you need people to like you to do your job correctly you know you got family issues that's going to be tougher Right. So, so I think that if you look like, like you come from a background of sales, correct? Right, Stacy. Right. Okay. So in sales, when people make a, an offensive comment to you, not knowing they did it, you're still trying to sell them the thing. So you don't go like, Oh, I, you know, you don't heckle back. You go, Oh, that's true. I do look like that. Don't I please buy my thing. <laughs> so that's way different been a social outcast who decided to become a comedian who when someone's interrupting their only opportunity that their introverted heart finally feels open to be extroverted ruins the opportunity they're going to go after them does that make sense i think that that's something that most people i was a school teacher i didn't get to roast the children okay when i taught high school i you know if a kid talked in class the the meanest thing i could say is that's it, Billy. You're going to have detention next time you do that. So I wasn't good with hecklers for my first three years. Right? I wasn't very good. My first three years, I was like, please, sir, just, just stop. They're going to fire me. <laughs> and then after a while, it turned into, you know what, screw you, because nobody paid to listen to you, bud. And then when the attitude changes, you change. Then you're able to handle it. Then you're like, uh, yeah, this is, yeah, you're, at that point, you're like, this is a PSA, everyone, for what happens when you drink too much, uh, you know. Well, it's crazy. No, I mean, it's, it's such a, that perspective has never, ever been brought to my attention at all. It's your insecurities that lead to your downfall, which, wow, thank you. Now I'm like. Now I guess we have a better idea. What yeah, one of the. Uh, I'm like, oh my god, I'm broken. One of the uh, yeah. workshops when I when I was taking Jerry Corley, he teaches you how to uh, start writing material too for hecklers. So that's a uh, pretty uh, fun stuff. Wait, just for <laughs> them? They're the ones heckling you. Like, why would you just decide to do comedy just for those guys? Uh, oh wait, no, that's not no, what you're you, saying. Yeah. Got it. Now, uh, it's Paul, the. It, how, I. Uh, <laughs> You I, have been such a great friend. We've known each other for a few years now, which is surprising because I can't believe it's been years now. Yeah. Not that long, but still a couple years. Um, you have been in the industry for several years, and you started as a high school teacher, but you actually ended up writing for Nickelodeon shows, right? Yeah, so I was a high school teacher from 2003 to 2006. And then when a teaching job fell through, I had, let, I had let the other job go. So now I'm in a position where I didn't know what to do. And my uncle was like, well, you always wanted to be a part of the industry. Why don't you come work as a production assistant at Nickelodeon? So within two months, I got promoted to the onset uh, executive producer's assistant. And then within a month from there, I got promoted to his full-time assistant, which was an almost six-figure position. And the... Mm. the and Nickelodeon, the thing about kids' t cable television is they do not get to have a lot of writers. There might be 25 writers on a major, you know, Hollywood big network sitcom. At Nickelodeon, there's four. Mm. So uh. I was able to be So what the, the, the position was, was his personal assistant as well as in the writer's room working on shows. So I got to help create iCarly. I got to help. Uh, do the final episode of Zoe 101. So to watch a television show complete itself, that's an education in writing. And then mm -hmm. at the same time, watching an, uh, the evolution of a show create itself. Like when the studio comes back and says, we don't like something, that's 
you know, watching how you handle that because the, art, the artists, the writers, the they're sitting there going, how, what do you know? And then they're looking at them going, well, what do you know? Right? We have to sell the show. And we don't think we can sell this. So there's a lot of interesting back and forth that I learned in those two, three years. And then the writer's strike happened. I decided to get a master's degree. I made a lot of short films. And then at uh, 32, I got into comedy. So I started mm. a little bit older than uh, most, you know. I mean, look, when I was 32 and I walked into my first open mic, I was like, why is everyone 12? <laughs> right. Why? What? You know, and of course they had not, they didn't know what to talk about. So I walked up and talked about having a job. I walked about, you know, walked up and talked about relationships. They were talking about, well, for the guys, mostly they were talking about their penis. Right. And, and for the girls, it was a lot of the same stories of getting drunk or bad dates. The, so, so, but they're all- Or their 20 penis. 20. Or their penis, you're right. Yeah, or their penis, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which in some cases, that just meant their husband's penis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. That's, you know what's crazy? So, Paul, your official title now with Floppers is director, right? It's the site director for workshops and classes, yeah. And Paul, I, uh, he was a student when I met him, so he is, and I, he deserves his title so very well. He has given me feedback from the very moment that I've met him. Uh, but it's incredible that a lot of students that take classes at Flappers have the most interesting occupations. Like I've met a bunch of lawyers Okay, so I, classes, right? Right, but that's because when Lawyer? we took them, classes cost anywhere from two ninety five two ninety five to three ninety five. So you had to have a job to take a comedy class at Flappers for a very long time. Like, and that's not a joke; that's just a reality. So a lot of times when I would talk to comics, we'd be like, "I can't afford this." I go, "Well, really, comedy comedy school's not necessarily." for comedians who are getting up five, six times a week, right? right? It's, it's a lot of times it's for people who want to do a bucket list. And so we get a lot of lawyers, a lot of teachers, a lot of doctors, a lot of accountants. We've had the people from Google show up. Like we've had everybody and they just want a place where they don't feel like they have to get up at 11, you know, go out at 11 o'clock at night and then get up at 6 a.m. for work, right? So they have a class at 7 p.m. And they're done by 10 and they can go home and then get their eight hours of sleep. It's just a different uh, group of, of clientele. It's a different group of people that want to do comedy that can't do the 22-year-old staying out till 1 a.m. lifestyle. So that's what we have. Now, we do have a lot of comedians who take classes because a lot of comedians still have jobs. But, you know, uh, there's two types of comedians. There's a full-time job comedian and then who lives in his own place. And then there's the guy who lives with five other comedians. Like, yeah. it's not like, right? It's not like there's, there's really, there's like two worlds. <laughs> there's two different worlds. You're either a full-time comedian with a full-time job, or you're a full-time comedian and you're just hustling for side money as much as you can so that you can eventually, now here's what's interesting, is a lot of the people who live with five, six people, like I know comics who slept in bathtubs. Mm. I know comics who sleep on the floor and someone sleeps in the bed. And then eventually, though, they're able to put in an amount of time and effort. This has always been my struggle, is I've always had to have health insurance. I'm diabetic. I cannot afford to pray one day for David Spade to give me a writing job. Right. <laughs> I have to go to the doctor. I have to take medication. If I was a healthier person, I probably would live with five other dudes, pay $300 for rent, and pray to God that one day I'm writing for David Spade and Bill Maher. It's interesting that you say bucket list because, like, I started at 41 years old, and uh, I probably got five years left with what I do. So, I mean, I think a lot of us, I, I, I think it's a lot of us have always watched the specials, and we're like, we we have jokes, we we have something to say. I want to say something. And that was me. That was me yeah. a couple of years ago. And I was always on the fence about about trying stand-up comedy. I always felt like it was kind of silly of me to do so. And I actually ended up taking a flappers class. Um, and I realized that I really 
enjoyed talking to the crowd. And I actually had really bad stage fright. Like I had awful stage fright and my anxiety would just kick in, but I always felt like I had something to say. And I know financially classes are not always easy to obtain because of financial reasons, but it helps when you can't properly form the things you want to say, which right. is, I, that's where a lot of it, that's why I've always been grateful to you because I would, we, I would go to uh, our, the, the class mic and I would say the most stupid of things or I would have nothing to say and I'd just riff and it'd be somebody say, hey, maybe you can go this way, or you can go that way. Sometimes another person's perspective can actually change the entire thing and actually make it really funny. When, when I, I took over for the classes and workshops in November, and January we had a great month, I reached out to a lot of people. Uh, the moment in March when the pandemic hit, we, we slashed every price in half. We knew that people were going to have the free time to be able to do it, but not the, the money, which is the great irony, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, finally, I could take a comedy class at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, but I'm broke. So we were able to accommodate to that. We were able to work with people on that. And like you said, what comedy, all what, what a good comedy class should do is first off, it should never promise fame or fortune. Yeah. And, and, and a, lot of, a lot of schools have done that. I'm not going to say who, but a lot of schools are like, take our class. We made so-and-so a superstar. No, you didn't. I remember that when dating before, like I would never promise fame and fortune for be going out with me. Right. Well, you understand. See, yeah. Yeah. It just wouldn't happen. Yes. The, the secret to life is to under-promise and over-deliver. Um, but, but, but then the other thing, too, is, the other thing, too, is, is that um, a comedy class should be able to allow you to understand two concepts. One, brevity. Less words is better. And two, you have to have a punchline. Because most, most open micers don't have punchlines. When you're starting out, it's attitude, right? It's like, what's the deal with this thing that nobody likes? Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's like, I, and so in comedy class, what I'll say is, well, how do you feel about that thing? Oh, well, it made me scared or it made me feel uncomfortable. Okay, say that. Right. And now we can develop a punchline. I have a new expression that I'm using in my classes, which is the setup is for me. The punchline is for the audience. And what that means is if I say I'm having trouble dating because I can't find a girl that, um, you know, that meets my value system, that might be a truth. The punchline is going to be because, you know, hey, why would I date anybody who hasn't seen all 12 Rockies? Right? <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, only, there's only seven. But right. the, point is, the point is, is that I can say something that's truthful but the punchline can be an exaggeration. The right. punchline can be something. And that's what a lot of comics don't understand. They think the punchline is for them. So, yes. now, so they'll be like, I don't believe that. And you're like, but that's not the point. Go watch Jerry Seinfeld, okay? When he talks about how he, when he had orange juice as a kid and he used to have to chop it like it was a serial killer, he really didn't feel that way. He's making an exaggeration, right? He's making, an, uh, he's making a bigger point. And but but the beginning his setup is life as a kid is hard because you have to have this frozen orange juice box at school. That is a statement of truth. The exaggeration is where he finds the punchline. And when and that's what a comedy class should do is explain the basic fundamentals of comedy. And then from there, you should begin to develop a voice. You should begin to develop what do I want to say? Do I want to talk about my dating life? I want to talk about how my parents screwed me over. I want to talk about how corporate America sucks. Whatever. But then you got to have a punchline. <laughs> like, this is a constant. Like, when somebody asked me the other day, they go, how hard is it to make it in comedy? I said, if you have punchlines, it's actually pretty easy. Because you got to figure this. You got this many people trying to be a comedian. This many people are actually kind of funny. This many people are doing it on a regular basis. And this many people are actually have punchlines. That's that's the difference. And uh, like I, you know this, I think I've told you this. I have a dry bar special coming out uh, at the end of the year, 
And I'm very excited about this. And I, I filmed it two years ago, and then they've had a backlog of too many specials, and so it ended up getting backlog. Mm -hmm. But I was able to, within three years of comedy, of pure stand-up, I was able to get a dry bar special. Nice. And it wasn't because it wasn't because I was funnier than anybody else. It was because I took it seriously and I had punchlines. A lot of stand-up comedians don't have punchlines. That's it. They're funny people. And how many how many of us know that comedian who's hysterical one on one? Then they get on stage and it's just a disaster. Oh shit, that's me. <laughs> that is. <laughs> and so that's that's all. That's what comedy class should do: is help direct you to a punchline. I yeah, I, it's interesting because you're basically telling me I can't just smash watermelons anymore. Fuck. Technically, you can because Gallagher sells the act. So you could be Gallagher 3. Oh, okay. <laughs> Paul, Paul, I don't know me, if I could. <laughs> Maybe someone else. <laughs> Paul, um, let me uh, ask you something or just run. I want to run this past you. It was something I got from another teacher and I just, I have been, um, I love kind of making sense of it all and, and actually going to comedy classes, but I was working with a, working on a set and what the teacher actually told me, she says, you have the punchline, but what you don't have is a strong setup. And the reason your punch is not landing is because she said a lot of times it's more likely it's in the setup where you're not, you know, and honestly, since that day, I absolutely get that. And I have found just as an individual, just me, Dana Keel, sometimes I feel like I do have these, it's, it's what she said. Like there's these great kind of landing spots I have, but then I realized I'm not setting it up. And I find that the more I tell a joke that I can find better setups. And then going back to the thing that you said that I definitely have to keep learning is brevity. Like how can we reduce the amount of words, still set it up strong and then punch it? Like, what yeah. do you think? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Right. The other expression I, I we use at Flappers a lot is uh, punchlines are easy, setups are hard. Mm. So, 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 so you, really what you have is you have a world in which you have comedians who have a lot of attitude with no punchlines. And mm -hmm. then you have comedians with a lot of punchlines but no setup. Okay. And so it's two different problems, right? Right. So, so, so basically, if you look at a setup, a setup has to basically have three elements. What mm -hmm. the hell am I talking about? <laughs> How do I feel about it and why? Okay. Right? So mm -hmm. Donald Trump is the president and it's scary because he might do this. Done. Got, now right, I got it. Punchline. Mm -hmm. Or uh, you can talk more personal. I always encourage more personal. Um, I had to call my mother the other day and it's annoying because she keeps telling me I need to get married. Right? Mm -hmm. I have to have a topic, a way I feel about it, usually negative. <laughs> Right? Because nobody wants to hear, well, I went on a date last night and it was wonderful because we had tons of sex. Like, <laughs> no, one, no one wants to hear that story. Nobody. Okay? And even an attractive comedian who could say that, people would be like, screw you, buddy. Okay? <laughs> right? So, it. so, it usually has to be negative. I went on a date and it was annoying because she did not want to sleep with me at the end. That, at least, there's a conflict. There's some type of complaint. Right? From there, I can begin to establish the punchline. Because once I establish, you're right, once you establish a strong setup, the turn or the twist does not have to be true, but at right. least it's going to, you know, allow, a good setup allows for really fun, you know, uh, 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 punchline. So if I talk about how I went on a date and it ended badly, the punchline could become something where I talk about how I said something stupid, right? <laughs> so it's not that she was the problem, it was me. Right, right. So, so that's that's really what it comes down. But you're right, and so I believe there's two different problems in comedy: one weak setups, one weak punchlines. Right. Now, the person with weak setups and weak punchlines, God bless their heart. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. But then, hey, listen, if you have five dollars, you can go to any club that lets you do it for five dollars. Or if you can, if you want to buy vodka, they'll let you do it. <laughs> so let's try this real quick. Okay, let's see. Donald Trump is scary because he made me realize that the worst clown makeup is fake Tanner. So here's nope, what it's I would failed. <laughs> here's the mistake you made. Donald Trump is scary because 
what's the real re if the punchline is the Tanner joke? Donald Trump is scary because you realize any type of person can become president, especially someone with a fake tan. See, that's what you would want. Uh. Clown tan. See, that's how you would want to set that up. Anybody could be president, even a guy with a clown tan. So that's how you would set that up. Yeah, I usually when we when it does work, I usually just say that I realize now that the fake the scariest clown makeup is fake tanner, and I don't say the beginning right. part. But right, but right. yes, you're right. <laughs> um. So uh, Paul, I just wanted to chime in earlier at something you said. There are like I've been taking different classes, different places from UCB to different teachers, and lawyers are like a wild card group of people with money. Let me just say that it's that you said bucket list, but after over time, I've met a lot of attorneys who don't practice law. They do anything and everything, but, and I've just, I said, you guys, if there was ever the Uno wild card of professional life, you guys are it. And you're the most dangerous because you make lots of money, no matter what you do. If you show up for an hour, you can make good money if you show up a whole day. So I think a lot of times you have, you know, I've just met even at my UCB classes, wherever I'm always meeting attorneys because they have the means but they are still people who get to have a professional title and get to still search for themselves, even if they're making six figures, you know, doing their professional work. And I think that's why there's a good number, uh, you know, a nice number. I'd have to do real stats and real research in comedy because I have I have a good girlfriend. She went to engineering school at Howard, like full scholarship, total, whatever. So like patented. She actually became a mechanical engineer, patented some kind of special pasta fork then went to law school and now she's doing comedy full time. So yes. I'm just saying, and so she's, the, and I, during, as a gen extra, there was a period that a lot of my engineering school colleagues were all going to law school and doing this law thing. But again, I think more than engineers, law people, lawyers rather, are just the wild card of the professional world who have money, like who just have money to do what they want to do, you know. Uh-oh. Just a you know thought. Here's the thing about lawyers is that a lot of times a lawyer will get an accidental laugh from a jury. <laughs> it becomes a drug. Does that make sense? Yes. Unlike, unlike the cocaine. Right. Yes. I think well, that happens to everyone in general that they think that they're funny because a group of friends or a group of strangers laugh at that very one small joke they make. Right. So, so, so here's the thing. Jerry Seinfeld said, first you have to make your friends laugh. Then you have to make strangers laugh. Then you have to make strangers pay to laugh, right? Most of us get to level two. That's, that's kind of where a lot of comedians get to. Is that it's hard to get that career going, right? But for mm -hmm. lawyers, I think that also they like the idea of the argument. And comedy has an element of argument to it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, so there is a sense of, I'm right. Other people are wrong. Uh, so they might get people to pay, to laugh for them, to pay to laugh through subpoena. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, well, think about this. If a, if a lawyer went up, they're going to make the argument that my that my wife was wrong when she told me I had to do X, Y, Z. Right? That's kind of what comedy is a little bit, is making an argument about your your point of view on a topic. And so lawyers do appreciate that idea. Mm -hmm. But here's the other problem, though. Lawyers, very much more than any other profession, get uh, lost in what the, the, the they can't see the forest from the trees. Mm. So what happens is, is they get a little too deep into it, and then they forget the fact that there still has to be a playfulness to comedy. There still has to be kind of a free-flowing nature to comedy. Mm -hmm. You still have to be acting as if this, you know, what, what is the trick of comedy? To make people think you didn't actually write the joke. Right, right, right. So, but the lawyer has to look in the courtroom like he really prepared for the case. So right. they they tend to like have a little bit of that conflict uh, of that. But I do think there's a sense of argument that they appreciate. Yeah, and that's such an interesting view because I I think that's what makes Larry David so funny. He's the defense type attorney where you know they're wrong, but he give you a good idea as to why they think they're right. And right. I've never actually seen it that way. That that's actually a great view on it. That's that's what George Costanza was. Mm. It's, yeah, not, that's it. it's not lying if you believe it. <laughs> Wait, 
Are you so, saying that that's what Donald Trump is too? It's not lying if you believe it. I, I feel that's a good, you know, summation of him. If Donald Trump, if Donald Trump wanted to be, he could have been a great stand-up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> he probably could. He would have been. He would have been basically Larry the Cable Guy. And but instead, not- he'd be he'd be Donald the Rich Douche. Instead. I can see him as a Larry David to tell you the truth. It's like I could see him as a curb like person. But but couldn't no you just way. But imagine if Larry the Cable Guy would have walked out on stage and said, Mexicans are the worst. <laughs> like, like like that would have that might have hit. You know what I mean? That might have worked with, with Larry the Cable Guy going, Can you believe them Mexicans are sending their rapists over here? Like that would have been a different type of bit. But I think that Donald Trump would have tapped into some weird Jeff Dunham, Larry the Cable Guy, uh, id that people would have responded to. Because they I mean, if, if he came out and you know said that about Mexicans, like he'd be like the he'd be like the uh, George Carlin for rednecks. Okay, my, yes. my problem with Trump <laughs> would be that he would normalize mail in order brides from Russia, and it's already hard to date in L.A. Okay, I don't need no more fucking competition. I, that's the only reason I hate Donald Trump because if he makes up the new normal, I'm fucked. I'm never going to get a husband. Well, but you know what? That's where Donald Trump, as a comedian, would have gone. He would have been like, I couldn't find any women. I had to find a Russian bride. Like, fabulous, fabulous. They don't, they don't cringe as much when you want to pee on them. <laughs> so I think, I, yeah, I, th- there's something there about the types of people who get into comedy who have kind of a lawyer, doctor, accounting background. They see things in a certain type of logic, and they like to play with that logic. Mm-hmm. Huh. Now, lots of, lots of, of which, what is your perspective on self-deprecating humor? Do you think that comedians have are more successful in doing that? Or is it just a simple, stupid laugh that they know they're going to get? Um, first off, our job is to get a laugh. So if it's a stupid laugh, you know, lots of comedians have made a wonderful career off stupid laughs. Right. right? Okay, so so the objective is to be funny. The object. Listen, if, if the objective is to be political, outside of a few people, it's usually bombs. Right or it's or it's very simplistic. Like when I see a comedian walk on stage and go like, "What's the deal with Donald Trump?" It's like, "Oh wow, what a deep thinker!" <laughs> you know? like, oh, oh, you, oh, you caught what the rest of us didn't. Good for you. Okay, here's the thing with self-deprecation that I've started to realize: I'm a self-deprecating comedian. But when I was in fifth grade and I started to put on weight, my dad said, "Make the joke funnier than they can make it." So I grew up being a self-deprecating guy. I made people laugh about my own weight and my own size and my own whatever well before, okay? So nobody, everybody knew if we just shut up, Paul's going to have a better joke about being a terrible athlete or a terrible this than anybody else, okay? But as for self-deprecating, uh, Fluffy doesn't have a career if he doesn't talk about how fat he is. Jim Gaffigan doesn't have a career if he doesn't talk about how fat he is, right? Uh, right. Uh, John Panette, who I love... John Panette, John Panette is my favorite comedian of all time. Outside of you know, like, there's a there's like a top five that could kind of shuffle, right? But Panette, in fact, I met his manager one time. His manager uh, represents Ron G, wonderful comedian, and um, his manager his manager came up to me after a set that I had hosted for Ron G, and he said, um, he goes, listen, and I almost cried. I really did. I almost cried. He said, uh, I, I watched your set. Uh, I was John Panette's manager. Some of those jokes, those those would have been the jokes John would have written. That's nice. And I, I literally, I'm sitting there, right, and I'm trying to. I literally remember grabbing my drink to cover my eye from crying. <laughs> so, but, but here's the thing with self-deprecation: it doesn't work if there's nothing to self-deprecate. Right. Gotta right. Be, uh, you got to be real and So all, I shouldn't start working out. Just right. Don't start working out. Stay fat. Stay bearded. Got it. I told, I told my mom when I started comedy. I said, you know, Mom, I have two roads. I either lose more weight and continue to lose weight, or I gain 100 pounds and get a Netflix special in two years. Either a comedy special or a reality show about you in a right. chair. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to come up in a wheelchair. Just, 
you know, I'm not disabled. I'm just 450 pounds. Um, <laughs> but, but, but here's the other thing that I found is that we, we there is this kind of war on self-deprecation. It's from the far right, like the Christian community, where it's like, don't speak bad about yourself. And then the far left, right, that also says like, oh, no, you should be self-esteem, right? Here's the problem. The groups that tend to be really against self-deprecation, in my opinion, and I could be wrong, are really big fans of making fun of the other group. Yeah. <laughs> and so the Christian comedians will make fun of the gays and they'll make fun of the, 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 the different political views, the Hillary Clintons, the Democrats, and the ones on the far left will make fun of the same Trump-supporting type of people. And so I, what I feel like is it's like self-deprecation is wrong, but making fun of the other group, A-OK. -okay. And so I don't like that at all. Like, that doesn't seem very fair. So I think the self-deprecation, I always tell my students, make fun of yourself first before you make fun of anybody else. Mm -hmm. That's the rule, right? If your opening joke is about how Trump supporters are this or how this particular group's like that, I go, you know what? If you make fun of yourself up front, you can make fun of everybody else. Because then everyone understands yep. that you're coming from a place of, I'm trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be mean. Oh. Because you're, you're trying to win them over first, right? Before you try to do anything else. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. And, and win them over is really just to get them to realize that, that, that you are not here to make fun of them specifically, right? It's the idea that you're here to see what's wrong with the status quo. And the first thing that's wrong with the status quo is I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm too bearded, I'm too this, I have poor vision. Okay. You're, you're getting all of them! You're getting all of them! Thank you! Yeah. Yeah, you guys are twins! And yeah, we didn't I'm, uh, I'm gonna go cry in a corner. See yeah. everybody. No. Uh. This is seeming like such a basic girl type situation. You're officially basic. I know, but the weirdest part is I'm married, so it kind of makes up for all of it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> big deal. <laughs> well, you know, I was talking to the Booker and Flappers last night where we were joking about, we're, it's not that I'm running out of material. There's always material. Right. Like tonight I did a show right before this, which turned out to be a talent show. It wasn't an actual show. I found out I was on a talent show. <laughs> <laughs> What's your talent, Paul? Yeah, have you done stuff? <laughs> I, roasted, I roasted the first five people before me, and then I had some fun. But my point is, we were talking, and I said, you know, I want to get married for the jokes. <laughs> like, 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 if I, like, like yeah. statistically, I'm going to get divorced. Statistically. So I figured, let's get, let me find a really cool girl. We'll get married. She'll tell me what, what's wrong with me, and then I'll tell the audience what she said. And I'll be like, world famous in like two years. <laughs> I mean, that seems yes, pretty sir. normal. Have you seen 90 Day Fiance? There's, there's a reason what? you're getting married. I oh, always thought that was about a fiance that sure. would dissolve after 90 days. Like, just disappear <laughs> like Thanos. Like, right. Oh, oh, Mom, where'd she go? My problem is, is I go after women who, who are very nice to me, but don't want to be with me. And so, <laughs> so, so it's like, oh, wow, she was nice. And she said that I was funny and, or she liked me or she liked three of my Facebook posts. I should ask her out. And then that was a disaster. <laughs> and, like, I literally asked a woman out the other day and she's like, oh, no, I have work the next morning. And I can't go out. I said, That's a, that is a legitimate reason to not go out. And then the two days later, it was Friday, and she was at a party on the top of a roof of a very cool place with other cool people in which none of them looked like me. <laughs> and then the next morning, she woke up, and she was in her apartment with her dogs putting Instagram stories up. And I realized she just flat out lied. But then on top of that, she kept putting in the Facebook stories, or I'm sorry, the Instagram stories, why will no one ask me out? <laughs> that bitch. I'm sorry. Anyway. That was emotional. Well, you know. one, day, one day I'm sure I'll find some guy who finds me beautiful. And I'm like, I'm not even going to come. I just, yeah. 
Well, make sure oh, that you know, doesn't become the negative energy where you're a nice guy online. So you know, make sure. <laughs> yeah, some 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 people, men and women, they just set the bar a little too unrealistically because they're they're not really grounded in reality. That's that's part of the problem. <laughs> well, the other problem is the other problem is, is that Marilyn Monroe married Arthur Miller, and this has been giving people like me hope for the last twenty years. <laughs> right, right. The well, same well, way uh, Janet Jackson dated. There's a great music producer who's awesome. His name is Jermaine Dupri. But when Janet right. dated Jermaine, I'll never forget Chris Rock coming on the MTV it was like MTV Awards, rather, just saying, "We all had a shot. If you're with Jermaine, I had a shot. We all had a shot." So uh, do we have oh. to remember none of these were successful? Like, uh, I don't know if that's the point of the joke right now. That's yeah. She became the other woman, and uh, Janet Jackson just got richer by getting a random baby daddy. So, so so remember this. Remember this. uh, uh, One of Norm Macdonald. I love this joke he did on Saturday Night Live, where he was talking about Julie Roberts and Lyle Lovett have just divorced. It happened when Julie Roberts realized she was married to Lyle Lovett. Right, right. Oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, what was that? I didn't do it. The right. Um, well, Paul. Uh, unfortunately, we've we've had our time. You've been a great guest. Thank it's, you. It's it's great to have you here. By the way, Paul, I will be uh, playing on December twelfth at Flappers, so I will make sure to get in a character and tape my tits down. Um, <laughs> Good. Let me, I just want to say this before you go, Paul. One, I feel like it's so wonderful to meet you here because, A, I get the emails every week. And because I think I've accidentally put it on two different emails, then I, I, I get it twice. I get the same emails back to back. And much like Dan, it's been my pleasure to do like, it's like that when I first started getting booked at Flappers because I was so new and so excited, I would count like, oh my gosh, this is the third time. This is the fourth time. And, you know, and it's been a blessing. I am a very spiritual person. Um, it's been a blessing to like lose count of how many times that I've been blessed to be booked at Flappers. So I just think it is an amazing um, institution for growing comedians yes. and for someone I've been in LA for just over 20 years and I did not, I tried out comedy very early in my time of getting here, but I went on to work in different industries, music industry on the film side, music videos were very popular and to finally make my way back. And one of the first things that an encouraging person told me was you'll be booked at Flappers in no time. Um, she's like, you're already good enough. You know, I think you just have to keep doing the mics. And so it's just really nice to really meet you because it's, it's, um, for everyone here, it's a big part, you know, obviously we're not necessarily here to talk about or, you know, all that, but just, it's a big part of what is shaping my journey and just grateful to, to meet you in person and, I, I and learn way more about you than I knew. I, I definitely want to go ahead and say that if you, anyone watching is considering and trying to stand up, Paul is beyond involved. Um, I've taken multiple comedy classes, and the one thing that I've realized is you can have a teacher that has the experience, but the reality is they can be listening. They're just laughing, providing some feedback, but you're not really connected to your teacher in the sense that you think they're actually paying attention to you or giving you the feedback that you feel can actually be constructive. Paul is beyond amazing. He is very informative. He actually listens. He actually tries to help you structure a good punchline and setup. I highly recommend if you are thinking about doing stand up, he is the perfect teacher to start with. Thank you. And with that said, uh, don't worry, Stacey. <laughs> we're going to give you that $100 for the endorsement. <laughs> Why, thank you. No, That's definitely not the case. No, I'll be definitely looking into taking some classes with y'all, uh, Paul. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're wrapping up the year right now. You know, it's hard to do classes anytime after, like, the second week of December. Right. Uh, because people are busy, but we'll start up again in January. And, you know. Yeah, c- comedians are busy being mall Santas, right? Well, remember, <laughs> what we talked about it's the lawyers. The lawyers are the ones who take those two weeks off. Right, right. <laughs> So, so we we will start up again in like you know mid mid January again, and and, and uh, but the only thing that we really try to do with any of our floppers classes is we're trying to build comedy community. Um, yes, we've had a lot of our students. We've had a lot of our students develop their own uh, writing groups. We've had students be able to develop their own TV writing groups. Like we teach writing classes, 
And so we've had students that have decided they got together to just keep writing. So they, they paid, you know, maybe $200 for a class, and then they started their own Zoom group. So really what, what, what I'm most proud of is the ability to build community and the ability for people to build friendships, because that's, that's what Flappers did for me when I started out. Mm-hmm. And so that's all you just want to do. You just want to give people an opportunity to make some friends and to feel like they're part of the community. Network, network, and network. that's why that that's why uh, comedy has really been therapy for me. As I've started it, is I've met so many people that actually want to laugh. I, I work in software during the day, so I don't meet too many people that want to laugh during the day. But but at night, I come and I talk to people like yourself, Paul, and to people here on the podcast like uh, Dana, Stacy, and and Stefan that actually want to laugh for part of their life. And, uh, you know, it's it's been really good. So if you're one of those type of people, I mean, like Paul said, there's different types of comedians. You could be someone who just comes in to laugh part-time and help others laugh part-time. It's really great. Yeah. 